Wow, so, can't believe it. The last few months have gone quite fast. We've actually come today, we've come to the last in um, our series called Our Father. Over these past uh, three, two and a half, three months, we've spent time thinking about and reflecting on what does it mean for God to be known as our Father if we are in Christ Jesus? And how can we relate to him as his children? It's something perhaps that we know, it, it, mentally we know, if we've been Christians for a while, but, but what does that really look like? How can we deepen our relationship with God? And um, so we wanted to take our time. We didn't want to go quickly. It's not something that you, you can't grow a, a relationship quickly. And so we've spent these last two and a half, three months um, spending that time getting to know him better. Today, as we uh, conclude, we're going to have a shortened uh, message today because I wanted to give the opportunity for people if you would like to share some testimony, something that God's been doing in you, through you, um, over these last couple of months to be able to share that after the message. Uh, but our final message is a great one of hope and it's called this, Christians, children of God, are inheritors of the Father's kingdom. So we've got two readings today. Um, uh, Sarah and Reuben are going to come and read them. So if you'd like to both come forward, Sarah's going to read first from 1 Peter chapter 1. Um, and Reuben's then going to read from Matthew chapter 25. So just take a moment if you'd like to, to sort of put your fingers into those passages. 1 Peter Chapter 1 is the first one. It's up on the screen, but also good to have it open in your Bibles too. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Thank you. We'd like to turn to Matthew chapter 25. Ruben is going to read from verses 31 to 46 which is the parable of the sheep and the goats. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. The king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whenever you did these for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who were cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They will answer, Lord, 
When did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger in need of clothes or sick and in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whenever you did not do these things for one of the, one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Lovely. Thank you very much. So just, uh, yeah, just keep, keep those two passages in hand. And um, we, have, we have three very brief headings today. And the three headings are this. True inheritance, true children, and true joy. So let me pray for God to open our ears and our hearts to hear from him. Lord, we just pray that what you want to say to us today um, would be heard not just with our ears, but, but with, with our hearts, that we'd be open to you, be open to your spirit, convicting us, prompting us, assuring us, helping us, and growing us. We thank you, Lord, that you have a word for each one of us today. And so we ask that we would yield our, our lives over to you, that you would have your way, your kingdom come, your will be done in our lives as you wish. In Jesus' name. Amen. True inheritance. When, um, when I was going to propose to Sarah, uh, I needed a ring. And uh, I wondered, what, what am I going to do? How am I going to propose? I need a ring. I was talking, talking with my parents and my, my dad said, he said, ah, I've got a ring. When, he, when one of his aunts died, he inherited a few things from her, including a particular ring. This isn't, this isn't the ring. This is a, a picture I found because we don't have the ring anymore. But he had, he had inherited from her a, a nine-stone cluster diamond platinum ring. It was quite a chunky thing, right? And he said, he said have the ring. Because um, you can propose with the ring, but if it's not quite what she likes, then sell the ring and then buy her the ring that she'd like. So I thought, great. And he said, one more thing. He said, the ring has got an insurance replacement value of £3,000. And my eyes lit up. 3000 Well, we can sell it, buy a ring, we can pay for the whole wedding. This is perfect, right? So we thought. So we took the ring along to, to try and uh, see where we could sell it. Took it into a jeweler. The jeweler said, well, we need to show it to a trader first. Leave it with us for a week and come back. At the end of the week, with much anticipation, went back to the shop and the guy said, well, some of the stones are a bit loose and it's not in the best shape. Best price we can give you is £140. Well, the elation of hearing that 3,000 down to 140, you can imagine. My chin was on the floor. We thought, this is ridiculous. We're going to get a second opinion. And actually, when we, when we looked at our options, we thought, let's auction it. Someone out there is going to want this ring. Someone is prepared to pay the price that we think it's worth. So we took it to an auctioneer's, and they put um, a, a sort of a reserve price on it. We had it put in the brochure. And we thought, should we go along and sort of see what happens? And we did. Did you come with me? Or was it just me that went? Can you remember? can't remember. Anyway, I, I definitely went along. So I thought, right, here, the money's going to come in. 3,000. It's worth 3,000 pounds. Someone's going to see the value of it. Sat there. We got people bidding, but not a lot. Do you know what it sold for? 350 pounds minus fees, which in the end took it, to less than 10% of the value that we thought we might get originally. Of course, an insurance value or a replacement value isn't necessarily the value that someone is prepared to pay for it. And that brings us to the whole topic of our inheritance. Because the things of the world often shout out to us, don't they? They either shout or they whisper to us of, of great things. The world tells us, this is going to make you. This is going to, um, uh, to, to give you all that your heart's desired. By the way, we, we did still manage to get Sarah a really nice ring. <laughs> and we still had enough for the wedding. God provided for us. But the point of this, 
The point of this illustration is that the world can often promise so much, and yet it can so often disappoint. Because so much of the world cannot meet the deepest desires and needs of our hearts. But I want us just to, 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 to go back to the passage that we read from 1 Peter to show the contrast that God tells us between the inheritance that he promises us in Christ and what the world offers us. Look at these words. 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Peter says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Praise our merciful Father, because the God who made us knows that what our hearts need more than anything else is himself. Through Jesus' death and resurrection, we have received forgiveness from our sin, we've received new life in Christ, and we've received a welcome into God's family. That is what every heart is searching for and yet gets waylaid or sidetracked or lured in by the world for other things, and many people don't find it. But praise God for his mercy, that if you are a Christian today, if you're a believer in Jesus, God has opened your eyes, and God has opened your heart to receive the one thing that can never be taken away from you, the one thing that you need, him. And it's why we stand here every week and we say, if you do not know Jesus yet, if you have heard the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for your sin and has won for you freedom and forgiveness, if you don't know him, you may have heard the gospel many times. And when we say, listen with your hearts, not just your ears, it goes in and it, it goes off again. We say, turn to Jesus today because you can receive the gift. You can receive the inheritance, the true inheritance that we're going to be bigging up today. And that true Christians can enjoy forever. So it's good news, isn't it? Because if you're members, if we, if you are members of God's household, then you get to enjoy all of the family blessings, the family blessings that are there for every child of God. What are they? In this series, we've talked about them time and time again. We've talked about the perfect love of God that you receive. We've talked about the security that we have through the Holy Spirit living in us, securing for us our adoption and our complete security in God. We've talked about the Father's faithfulness to us in every way. He's the most faithful parent we can ever have. That God provides for our every need. He knows what we need before we even ask. But he loves for his children to come and ask and talk to him. We know that the God um, uh, disciplines us. We, we thought about that a couple of weeks ago. He disciplines us. Why? To bring us up into his holiness. He wants to share the very best with us. He wants to share the best of who he is. And he wants us to be more like him. It's what God's plan is. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we thought about how he shapes us. Was it last week? He shapes us in such a way that as we grow and copy him, we just become more like the perfect son, Jesus. And he's conforming us into his image. God has the very best for us. And you get to enjoy and we get to enjoy all the family blessings if we've turned to Christ and we're in the family of God. The promise of our inheritance is such a great one. Isn't it a great one? Because if Jesus, the perfect son, has overcome death, if he has, if that is true, then nothing is too big for God. And the one thing that he offers us can never be taken away. This, this last line here, the inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, is a true promise from God. People promise us stuff all the time. But God is trustworthy because Jesus has risen. He is alive. And he says, what he has is waiting for you. So people worry. We worry about all sorts of things. We can worry about our income. We can worry about our houses. We worry about our investments, our savings, our pensions, our potential inheritance. And we can worry about all those things because none of them are secure but what is secure is this, 
what Jesus has won for you will never, ever fade, will never spoil, will never run out, will never be taken away from you if you're in Christ. And God is the one who promises that to you. Well, he says what's waiting for us will blow our minds. And so I want you to stay with me today. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son um, that we looked at earlier in our series? The problem he got wrong is, is this. He wanted his inheritance now. So he went to the father and demanded that the father give him everything that he was owed. But in doing so, he missed out. He missed the very point of what it meant to have the inheritance in the first place. Being in the family. The son took everything he could from the father, but he rejected the father. He wanted those good things, but he didn't realize that the real blessing came from being within the family. And it wasn't until everything ran out for the son that he realized the mistake he'd made. The emptiness of taking the stuff and yet realizing that the relationship was what it was all about in the first place. And when he returned back to the father and the father welcomed him back with joy and forgiveness as God does, the son then was able to enjoy the family blessings of their family estate. And so it is with us and God. We, we live in the world and God has richly blessed us with all sorts of things. But we can take the good things of God and keep them for ourselves and say that we don't really want to know God for ourselves. And so we miss out on the very thing that he wants for us more than anything. And isn't God merciful? Isn't God merciful? and forgiving and kind and patient with us, that when we return, when we realize what it's all about, in the end, when our resources run out, when all the things that we thought we put our hope in don't fulfill us, God says, I'm still here. <laughs> I'm still here. Maybe that's you today. Maybe you've been chasing after things in the world. And God's saying, please return. Return to me. Because what you find in me is worth more than anything that you're chasing after. The pagans chase after those things. But your heavenly Father knows what you really need. <laughs> Our true inheritance is Him. What about being true children? The Bible has various descriptions and images of God's radical transformation, what he does in our lives when we come to Christ. Think of some of these contrasts. The contrast, a bit like the prodigal son story, the contrast of being lost and then found. Or the contrast of being dead, but being made alive. But also we have this contrast of being slaves, but then being adopted. That last image uh, talks about, it describes who we belong to. The slave belongs to a master, but the slave, the, the bad news for the slave is that the slave is in bondage. The Bible talks in various ways about being a slave. You could be a slave to fear. Or you're a slave to sin. Outside of Christ, you cannot stop yourself from sinning because you're not with God. But what's the difference? Is that when we come to Jesus, we, we're, not a, we're not a slave anymore. No, we're a child. We've been adopted. A child belongs to parents. A child in the Bible belongs to a father. And the difference is rather than being in bondage, the child is completely secure, loved, secure, wanted, valued nurtured and so we become children of God I don't know if you're into your Christmas ads you're picking up on the adverts the John Lewis um, Christmas advert is the one that sort of so many people anticipate every year have you seen it yet is it out yet I've seen it I've seen it myself um, as a preview and uh, you've, got this, you've got this guy, this middle-aged man. This is how the first sort of minute of the uh, advert goes. This middle-aged man learning to skateboard. And uh, he, he's falling off his skateboard. He's having bumps. And you think, what is this? One, what's this got to do with Christmas? And two, what is the purpose of this message? What's going on? What's the message behind this? And it's not until towards the end of the, the advert that we begin to see what's going on. The man and his wife are preparing to welcome in a teenage girl, I think it's to, to be fostered, into their household. And they'd known through, the, through meeting her before that she was into skateboarding. And so this middle-aged man is out on the streets, practicing his skateboard, learning, prepared to fall over and embarrass himself. 
because he wanted to welcome the girl in to his home to show that she was valued, to show that he was taking an interest in what she cared about so that she could feel comfortable and loved and known. Doesn't this image our Father so much? When you think about the love of God, what do you think? Do we sometimes think that the love of God is a general love? Oh yeah, God loves the world. He loves the world in a general sense. Or do you think that God loves you? He loves you. He's a personal God. He knows you. He made you. And he knows everything about you. And he meets you exactly where you are. He knows your hopes, your fears, your likes, your dreams, the things that are frustrating you, your hurts, your wounds. God knows everything. And he is a father that meets us where we are and he welcomes us in. Isn't that a great God? (laughs) Isn't he a great God? Look at what Paul says in the New Testament in Galatians about what God's like. He says, because you are his sons, son in the Bible, the, 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 the prominence of the firstborn son inheriting, yeah, but it's children, of course, for us. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. If you're a child, if you're a child of God, if you know God, your Father, through Jesus Christ, then you are an heir. And isn't this the wonderful thing? A child may inherit someone's estate, but if off, if if the, uh, the, the father in our household is no one other than the king of heaven himself, then what is your inheritance going to be like? Our inheritance is enjoying the blessings of the perfect kingdom of heaven, which we have a little taste of now because Jesus has entered our hearts by his Holy Spirit. But the taste that we have is nothing compared to what we will enjoy when we get there in the end. But guess what? Our experience of inheriting things is because the father or the parents have died and we take on what they've left behind. But even better than that, for us, if our inheritance is God himself, to be with him, to be close to him, to know him forever, to have all that we need in him, then as we enjoy the perfect kingdom, we will be in harmony with the king of kings and we will see him and we will be with him the eternal one who reigns forever. You will be there. And isn't that a great promise? Because we can know God now by his son, through the spirit, but sometimes we just don't feel very close to him. I don't know about you, but you know, we spend a lot of our lives, don't we, wondering what God is doing in our lives, how he's trying to speak into our circumstances, what he really wants for us. We get confused by his purposes. Sometimes God seems distant. We know he's there, but we're struggling. Again, Paul in the New Testament describes it a little bit like this. He says, for now, we see only as a reflection, as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. The wonderful thing is this, God knows you, God knows us fully. He knows us completely, there's nothing lacking from his point of view, but we don't yet. We don't yet, we don't even know ourselves half the time, but we don't yet know God fully, but one day you will. One day, those question marks, those confusions, those frustrations, those difficulties will be gone, because one day, one day, as we sung in the song at the beginning about the ancient of days, you will see God face to face. Won't that be a glorious moment? We're reflecting on that in our Bible groups this week. What will it be like? What will it be like when we get there? And those barriers almost between us and God, which we create or we struggle with, they'll be gone. And we will see him face to face. And we will be happy. So why does God keep us here? If, if that's in store for us and that is best for us and we know we want to be there, why does God keep us here? Why doesn't he just take us straight to heaven then? What's the point of remaining here when we're waiting for the thing that we really want? 
Well, he uses the time to refine us. He refines us. Remember how Chris, uh, Chris Thomas a couple of weeks ago was talking about how he, God can take us through hard times in order to grow us. He grows us to make us more like him and prepares us to meet him so that we can an- have that anticipation of meeting him because we realize that the world can't fulfill all the things that um, it shouts and tells us it will. Peter, when we go back to the passage that Sarah read from Peter, Peter also gives us a perspective on our current sufferings and trials and difficulties. He says this, he says, These difficulties have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, your faith may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Can you see that? Your faith is worth more than gold. When Jesus returns and takes us home, it will be worth it. Because nothing else will last apart from what we have in him. You know, it gives us all sorts of things that we can enjoy in life, and that's right, but we're to have them and not to idolize them. I'm sure that God's desire is that everything that he's given us is for us to use and to treat in such a way that it would cause us to trust him and depend on him rather than on those things. And that's where we get it mixed up. We can take those things, enjoy them, but actually then put too much hope in them. And God says, no, don't do that because everything will perish. But what is in Christ will remain and will not disappoint. When Jesus returns, he will judge the world and he will determine who are true children of God or not. The parable that Reuben uh, read to us is that parable of the, the sheep and the goats. And in verse 34 of Matthew 25, Jesus said this. He said, Then the king, on that final day, will say to those on his right, the sheep, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. See, Jesus will know who God's true children are for at least three reasons. Here's one. First one is this. Ephesians 1 tells us that God has chosen us in Christ before the creation of the world. And Jesus again confirms here that God has had things in hand for a very, very long time. The kingdom has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. That's that language again. God has had it planned. Jesus knows exactly who are his because we've been chosen in him. The second thing is that only Jesus truly knows our hearts. We may look around and wonder, is someone saved or not? Um, We'd love them to be. We want someone to know the gospel, but only Jesus truly knows. Of course, the thing about sheep and goats is um, in the Middle East, in Jesus' time, but even today, sheep and goats look very similar to each other. And to the naked eye, it might be very difficult for someone to discern one from the other. But the shepherd of those sheep and goats know exactly which are which. And Jesus, who is the shepherd, the good shepherd, knows. He knows who are his and who are God's children. Jesus knows everybody's hearts, even if we don't fully know. But the third thing is this. There is outward fruit from being a child of God. Our lives will be changed. Our lives will look different as we trust in Jesus more and more. Last week, we spoke about how as we trust in Jesus, we seek to copy our Father's example. We seek to, to live out um, the character of God in, his li- in, in our lives. He shapes us more and more to look like him as we give our lives back in thankful, willing, and humble sacrifice. And Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats talks about how the way that Christians love and care for those in need is a significant sign to show whether we are God's true children or not. See where Jesus said this, he said, whatever you did for the least of one of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. One of my brothers and sisters, Jesus is saying, what he means by that is someone else in the family. Who are the family? Who is the family of God? 
fellow believers, the church. So how we care for each other as church is a big sign in showing our likeness in Christ and being shown as children of God. We demonstrate God's character, don't we? As we follow our Father, his kindness, his generosity, his love, his care. And Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So we spent this um, year in our Lord's Suppers thinking about how we can be one another church. And our first one back in January was this, love one another. So how do you think we're doing? How are we loving one another in our church? What does our care look like for each other when we have need or where someone's missing or where someone's struggling? Or when we're praying for each other specifically through the prayer diary and God brings something to mind to help us encourage one another in love. I wonder what that looks like for you and how you might be able to show yourself more and more as a true child of God through the way that you love someone else or others in our church. True inheritance, true children, true joy. I just want to read some verses from Revelation, which is a great description of heaven and the joy that is before us. Revelation chapter 14. Then I looked... And there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and the loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps, and they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders." Our identity as children of God is to have the Father's name written on our foreheads. What a clear sign to us (laughs) and to others that we belong to the Father. It's there for our eyes to see and our hearts and our minds to remember. There is no greater joy, no greater joy will be ours than to be in the presence of God with the Lamb of God, Jesus, who has conquered death there right before us and for us to see the father face to face if it doesn't excite you if it doesn't excite you to anticipate the joy of being with god forever then ask god ask god for the excitement if something in the world is is pulling your heart for a greater joy than to be with your father forever ask god ask god for for mercy on you so that you might realize that what we need is found in him. Let me read one more thing. Revelation 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Trustworthy and true, that your inheritance in the Father's kingdom will be peace with God. Your inheritance will be peace with each other. Your inheritance will be peace with yourself. Because all of the effects of our fall from grace into sin will be reversed. Sin will be gone forever. There will be no more death. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. So each day, each day, why not remind yourself... You can say it out loud if you want, if it helps. No matter whether you're going through a really great period in your life at the moment or whether life is really hard. Whether today is a good day or today is a tough day. 
These are the words that you can say. The best is yet to come. C.S. Lewis put it like this. There are far, far better things ahead than any we leave behind. It's why Jesus told his disciples not to let their hearts be troubled. Why? Because his father's room has many rooms. Jesus is there now preparing a place for us. He said to his disciples then, I'm going there. That's where he is. He's there preparing a place. And he will return to take us to be with him forever. The kingdom awaits. It's your inheritance and mine. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, when we stop and think about what we've just been talking about, it makes it very clear to us that the things of this world perish, they spoil, they fade, they won't last, but you will. And our faith in Jesus Christ is what matters. That may be a great encouragement to us today. If we're hanging on to Christ, it means that our inheritance is secure. But it might be a challenge to us today if actually we're gripping on to things in the world too much. Or if actually we haven't turned to Christ at all and we don't know the security of being in your family. Please help us. Help us to respond to you. Help us to put our faith in Jesus and to have a renewed hope and a renewed assurance that what we have in Christ is ahead of us and will be ours and will last forever. Thank you, Father, that you are a good Father. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace to us today. In Jesus' name, amen.